So this is the beginning of chapter three, um, which is on the roots, soil, and uptake of nutrients. It concentrates heavily on uh, mineral nutrients and how plants take up those. Um, so we'll be looking at how nutrients move through the soil, how, root, how nutrients move into the root, um, different kinds of um, uptake, and um, then we'll be moving into some discussion of about uh, nutrient deficiencies and also how nutrients cycle in the soil and within plants and soil. So we'll start with uh, just kind of a basic quick review uh, of what we know about soil components, um, the components of the soil so far. So we talked about this with the last chapter. So remember there is a solid phase which includes um, which includes different sized particles that result from weathering of parent material or bedrock. And that those um, particles have varying sizes that's displayed over here, this um, diagram that we've seen before, um, with sand being the largest uh, then uh, silt being the next uh, size, whoops, diameter uh, particle. And finally, um, clay being the smallest. Now clay is what we're primarily going to concentrate on in this um, discussion for the mineral soil. Remember this is the mineral soil components. All right, the second um, part of the solid phase includes organic materials or organic matter and remember organic matter um, comes from uh, previously living materials whether we're talking about plant materials animal uh, uh, different kinds of bacteria fungi whatever previously was living uh, contributes to the organic matter in the soil and this organic matter uh, decomposes organic matter decomposition and into a form of unrecognizable organic matter which is called humus so remember that's unrecognizable uh, organic matter no longer can recognize it as a, a leaf in other words the second component large component here of the soil of soil is the um, liquid phase or what we call the soil solution and the soil solution um, consists of water plus dissolved nutrients or and those nutrients can be um, different kinds of ions organic acids um, whatever can be dissolved in the soil sugars even um, the soil solution is rather dilute solution on the order of something like just as a, a target here of one molar concentration uh, of whatever we're talking about or the sum of all um, uh, solutes and our third phase here is the gas phase the soil solution is the liquid phase And the gas phase, remember, is anything that we would normally find in the atmosphere, oxygen gas, uh, nitrogen gas, carbon dioxide gas, and it's always in equilibrium with the atmosphere. Okay. Um, then we have our soil community, and we'll mention those a bit more this time, which are... Um, basically all the other living organisms in the soil um, such as earthworms and bacteria and fungi and uh, invertebrate organisms and they basically set up a whole food web of interactions in the soil and as a result of their activity they lead to decomposition of organic matter and um, basically um, 
make nutrients available to the plant in part we'll see a, def a couple of different sources of nutrient availability for plants but this is one of them all right so that brings us to uh, the next figure here which shows us uh, interactions all kinds of interactions between the root um, the the plant itself, the shoot itself, um, as the shoot becomes organic matter or the roots become organic matter, they decompose, bringing in nutrients. Weathering is another source of nutrients that um, basically weathering being chemical weathering where um, ions are freed from the parent material. Um, so we're going to kind of take a look at what's happening in the center of this figure here. So what we're looking at right in this area here that we're going to outline in blue are the is the soil colloidal complex. So we're looking at soil colloids here. And these colloids um, are formed. They're sort of like a unit of soil structure. So they're formed by the combination of clay uh, plus humus and uh, basically the as we remember the clay has a very small diameter structure and humus does can too actually so because of that they have a each of them have a high surface area to mass or volume uh, ratio and so the question is, uh, what are the benefits of that? What is the benefit of having a high surface area to mass or high surface area to volume ratio in the soil? Okay, the benefits of a high, and I'm abbreviating here, surface area to mass or volume ratio is that it maximizes the adhesion of ions to the colloids. Okay, so if we take a look over here at the colloids, um, we see um, that there's a lot of positively charged ions that are attracted, and that's because the soil colloidal complex is full of negative charges on the surface here. So what brings those negative charges is that um, clay is basically formed from aluminum silicates in many of the clays that we see. So when these ionize, they bring on, uh, they form negative charges. And that's what brings these negative charges on the surface. And humus is a combination of um, organic materials like lignin and other carbohydrates along with all kinds of other organic acids um, I'll write that down organic acids like tannic acids and uh, there's just a large number of things that we could include here but as a result because these are organic um, there's a large number of hydroxyl ions with the negative charge as well as carboxyl ions with the negative charge. And so those negative charged part parts are going to also attract these positively charged ions. So the colloids have negative charges. Or they're negatively charged. And therefore attract cations positively charged ions such as potassium and magnesium and calcium and ammonium and sodium and you can look over here at a long list of um, different kinds of cations even iron and um, man man manganese and all kinds of things that we could list Okay, so that means, 
So, so the soils binding to these um, uh, cations serves as uh, kind of a nice stable place for these uh, cations to, to remain in the soil so that they don't get leached out or washed away by the soil solution. So we would say that the soil colloids are the primary, uh, primary nutrient reserve for plants. They're that longer term storage compared to being in the soil s solution. So colloids are the primary equal to primary nutrient reserve. Okay. So that brings us to the next question, which is basically you want to know how tightly are the uh, cations bound to these colloids? And um, that is going to vary based on the, uh, the kind of ion we're looking at. How tightly are cations bound to colloids? Right, so uh, binding affinity is going to vary from ion to ion or basically varies from varies based on the valence of an ion. So uh, trivalent ions are held more tightly than divalent ions, which are held more tightly than univalent ions. And so what we can create here is then a binding affinity series. So the binding affinity series um, goes such that here we have aluminum with a tri which is a trivalent uh, ion. Uh, it has a higher binding affinity. So this is the high binding affinity end of the series. High binding affinity. Uh, it has a higher binding affinity than hydrogen ions, which is one of these other kinds of ions that um, we'll have to talk about a little bit more since it affects pH and um, it uh, interacts with um, negatively charged ions in such a way to, you know, either increase or decrease pH. It has a, a different sort of um, effect here, but in a way it has a high binding affinity. But then we go back to our valence series here, which um, the next uh, highly binding affinity ion is calcium, which binds more tightly than magnesium, which then binds more tightly than now our, our monovalent ion uh, potassium. And that binds very similarly to ammonium, which is greater than or tight, more tightly held than sodium. <coughs> so that means that uh, in this binding affinity series, we have to um, also know that we are assuming that all ion concentrations, oh, that's an abbreviation for concentrations, is equal. So we have to assume equal ion concentrations to use that binding affinity series. Um, so what that means is, say, for example, if we have, um, if, if, say, calcium ions are in solution, in the soil solution, then they exchange I'm abbreviating heavily here, exchange with something lower in the binding affinity series, assuming the concentrations are equal, such as here, uh, ammonium, <coughs> uh, which is a plus. Uh, we can also assume either basically that the ions or concentrations are the same or that lower binding affinity ions are less than higher binding affinity ions in concentration. Okay, so then that series would still apply. All right, so uh, actually there's a little error here in our series. We want to get rid of that too. It's just a, a positive one on the sodium. There we go. We can also assume higher exchangeability at the low end where these are, uh, ions are going to exchange more readily off the colloids than something that's more tightly bound. So we can say that exchangeability of ions uh, is r runs the reverse um, of the binding affinity series. Binding affinity series. 